Deborah, we can start, I think. You can make a start. Yeah, sure thing. As I said, unfortunately, I have a problem with my video this morning, folks, but it's very, very nice to be here. Um, I just wanted to talk to you this morning about uh, the upcoming International Scientific, Co Scientific Conference, which is happening on the 14th of March next year. Um, you'd be delighted to hear that the kind of progress has been made and we have some phenomenal speakers uh, confirmed for that particular event. The registrations for the event are now live. The early bird uh, tickets are available for sale. But I would say to everybody attending today, if you can um, if you can stay online until the end of this session, we have a very, very special offer for you in relation to the International Scientific Conference. So hopefully you'll all be able to join us. This year or this coming year, we have um, a really more, the most one of the most impressive arrays of uh, research abstracts we've had in many years. Um, as I said, all of the research abstracts that we are um, going to be featuring in this year's International Scientific Conference will also be featured in the April 2022 edition of the JBBA, which is, as you know, the world's leading um, blockchain evidence-based blockchain research journal uh, going out to all of the kind of diplomats, all of the educational establishments globally. Um, it to kind of in mirroring of that audience, we also can confirm that the attendees for the upcoming International Scientific Conference in March will be a, an esteemed group of members of the scientific community. We have our Commonwealth partners, we're also inviting and have confirmed representatives from the uh, Law Commission of England and Wales, as well as researcher from 25 universities. And we have eminent professors from those universities attending. Um, we also have confirmed academic partnerships and we are in current discussions with enterprise and industry leaders to also speak at that particular event. Um, there is some still some small opportunity to get involved. So if you would like to uh, discuss with us your enterprise or industry and representing same, please do get in contact with us, but as soon as possible, because we're pretty much, we've pretty much closed the agenda for the ISC for now. Um, but as I said, we would be very interested to hear if you had any um, ideas as, as to how you might represent uh, your industry or, or, or part of your industry at the ISC. Um, Dr. Nassim, I think you were going to talk about the ISC in a little bit more detail. Yeah, I'll I'll do that. Um, yeah, I think that is it really. So we have um, abstracts confirmed um, over a dozen, and um, we are just finalizing the the enterprise and the industry part. So if you want to um, participate or contribute, please do get in touch. And as Dr. Nassim said here, there are still sponsorship opportunities. Um, they are, as time goes on, becoming more and more limited. But I think, you know, this as, as a completely unique event, if you're, um, if you would like some very, very high level representation and brand representation of this particular event, there are still some sponsorship and kind of partnership, um, I suppose, opportunities available to you. And we will be able to kind of discuss those. If you can kind of get in contact with us by email, then we'll arrange a call and let you know uh, what is what is still available that you might be able to get involved in. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Deborah. So um, what uh, the plan today is that we have um, uh, an excellent speaker from Australia. And before I, I introduce him to you, um, I would like to say a, a few things. So, so Bitcoin is, a, is an incredible technology. And certainly one of the reasons I decided to uh, pursue a master's degree in cryptocurrencies many years ago is that I was fascinated by the potential of this innovation for our global uh, economy. And I'm indeed very grateful to all the academics and books and papers that helped me understand this um, slightly complex uh, topic. At the same time, there is a misconception that academics and economics and crypto economics are somehow, they hold a not so optimistic view of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, which is uh, bizarre since 
Uh, as of today, there are uh, more than 300 universities around the globe offering masters and PhDs programs in crypto economics, Bitcoin economics, blockchain. And this number is fast growing. And majority of these initiatives are led by senior academics who have not only made uh, enormous contributions to the body of science by doing uh, pioneering groundbreaking research work, but also uh, contributed to um, uh, taking uh, various initiatives to set up academic programs and research programs to teach the uh, future generation of innovators and torch, torch bearers. So we thought uh, who would be better than our uh, guest today, Professor Sinclair Davidson, who is a senior editor of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. He's also a professor of uh, crypto economics at uh, Armit University in Australia. And uh, Professor Davidson has written and contributed and co-authored and authored many books uh, on the economics of blockchain, economics of crypto assets. He's written many papers, uh, including this one, uh, which was published uh, about three, four years ago in the JBBA a very, very interesting paper, The Cost of Trust. And, and he's also uh, the author of the editorial of the November 2020 issue of the JBBA, uh, uh, the theme for which was institutional crypto economics. So without further ado, um, I will hand over to Professor Davidson uh, uh, to share his thoughts on Bitcoin uh, as an academic, and as a crypto economist and how he sees this technology and this um, innovation uh, change the global economy in the, in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nassim. That, uh, that's uh, very nice words. And, and Deborah, thank you very much for, for the introduction. Um, so I want to sort of start off by just going back. I think it might've been two or three weeks ago on Twitter. Um, somebody tweeted something along the lines of, um, all academics or all academic economists hate Bitcoin. And again, today, uh, my time today, and I think maybe uh, uh, your time yesterday, uh, somebody put out a very similar thing. And, and on Twitter, uh, Nassim responded to that saying, no, it's not true. Not all academics hate a uh, 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 blockchain and Bitcoin and all these sorts of things. So uh, um, when I got the, the, the invitation to speak, and, and thank you very much for, for the invitation, I kind of thought, this is what Nassim wants. He wants me to talk about the linkages between academia, uh, mainstream economics, what I'm going to call mainline economics, and blockchain and Bitcoin. Um, and then also tell you that this is actually a very exciting story. Um, this is a story that, that, that is going to change our world. So I want to tell all of that story. I can probably talk for about an hour or so. I know I've only got about 10 minutes. Um, so I will try and squeeze a lot of stuff um, into that 10 minutes uh, uh, period of time. And please uh, leave questions and what have you in the chat. And I, I will try and address some of those questions as well. So <clears throat> what is it? Um, what is it? Why, why do mainstream academics, economists, in the first instance, hate uh, Bitcoin? And I want to tell you a story going back to the, the, the dark ages of, of 2017. Uh, my colleagues and I, uh, Jason Potts, Chris Berg, and myself, we were trying to set up the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT University. And we were very successful in doing so. We had managed to sell the senior management of the university to give us some seed funding. And so what we were looking for were allies and partners in the economics department in particular and the business college in general and so we had a huge big open meeting at that uh, um, uh, in the college where we more or less presented uh, very quickly what blockchain and bitcoin were and also our proposal to have a hub that was going to was going to create blockchain courses was going to do blockchain research and all the exciting things that we've been doing over the last few years and we got three responses uh, the first response was um, I don't know what blockchain is. 
And I think in 2017, there were probably a lot of people in that position who'd never heard of it, had no understanding. Um, and this was the first time they'd actually heard those words. And, and that is a legitimate response. Then there were other people who kind of said, well, uh, um, this sounds like a lot of extra work. And we don't really want to do work. We're academics. Um, and so, you know, that, that was the second response. And the third response that we received was, if this is such a good idea, why are you three idiots doing it? Um, which we've never actually kind of forgotten. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite amazing because we were selling a very optimistic story, a, a, a great story about what the future of the global economy and, and, and social enterprise is going to look like. And nonetheless, people just simply didn't believe that uh, um, us three in general could do it. And also that, the, uh, and that they didn't have any um, actual uh, confidence in the technology itself. Now, why don't people have confidence in the technology itself? Because we've got to think, where does the blockchain come from? Now, we we know that it came from a white paper uh, produced by the pseudonymous individual or individual Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, and it came into existence in 2009, where he started uh, mining the, 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 the chain. Now, where the blockchain did not originate from, it did not originate from the university sector, and it did not originate from big business. This is actually a genuine, spontaneous, bottom-up innovation, which has taken the world by storm, I would say to you already, and is simply going to keep doing so, taking the world even more by storm as we go forward. So it doesn't originate in any of the well-known places. What else do we know about the blockchain? Well, the other thing we know about the blockchain is that it emerges out of the cypherpunk milieu, um, a group of West Coast American style libertarians who are more or less anti-authoritarian, anti-big government, um, anti-big business, and also want to empower individuals in order to have greater control over their lives, which is also something very different if you come from the bureaucracy of a big university system, which is part of the big state, which is part of the big institutions which control and impact upon people's lives. So there's also that hostility, but, but let's dig in deeper. Satoshi actually produced the Bitcoin as a permissionless money. Now, money has got a number of characteristics. One, it is a store of value. It is a unit of account and it is a medium of exchange. And in almost every country around the world, I'm kind of thinking there may be a couple of failed states where this doesn't actually happen. But in every country around the world, what actually happens is more or less the government provides you with money. And when you speak to people, they have this idea that we have to have government money, fiat money, that is the only form of money, that is the only legitimate money. So what actually happens is you have this unknown, pers unknown person on the internet suddenly saying to you, gee, I've got a different kind of money that relies on a computer technology that people don't really know, they don't really understand, um, uh, comes from a whole bunch of anti-government authoritarians, which is trying to be uh, 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 completely different in how it goes about solving social problems. Um, and so all of a sudden, people look at this and they think, gee, this is a bit strange. Now, if you're living in um, Australia, the United Kingdom, maybe the United States, certainly Canada, what have you, those sorts of high income economies that have got fairly stable institutional structures, the government money that you have for a long period of time has actually worked pretty well. So for the last 30, 40 years, there, well, not quite 50 years, but for the last 30, 40 years or so, we've had government money that if you live in Canada or the United States or the United Kingdom or Australia, New Zealand, um, these sorts of places, the money works well. Um, for, for what it is, it does well. Um, I put it to you, though, that's going to be changing very rapidly in the, near, in the near future. If the inflation that the global economy is experiencing now is actually an inflation and not a change in relative prices, it is very likely that government money is not going to work as well as it has been in the past. And then all of a sudden, crypto will become uh, uh, more valuable. But there was this argument that, crypt, uh, that, that Bitcoin was going to be the new money. 
Now, please don't send me hate mail, uh, crypto, uh, 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 Bitcoin maximalists. But as it turns out, Bitcoin itself is not really a good money. It may well be a good asset, and I don't have a financial planning license, so I can't advise you whether or not you should be buying it or not. But it is not a good money because, yes, it can work as a medium of exchange. It could work as a unit of account. But Bitcoin as a store of value is not a good store of value. Now, I imagine, Asim, that the, many of the listeners now are pulling their hair out saying, what are you talking about, Sinclair? Of course, it's a great store of value. It's gone up in price from being a couple of cents to being tens of thousands of, 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 of dollars each. And of course, the answer to that question really is, is that if you want a good money, it can't be appreciating or depreciating in value. So when your money is depreciating in value, it's called inflation. When your money is depreciating in value, it's called deflation. We, we, we don't actually want that to happen. So money should be neither appreciating, which is deflation, or uh, uh, um, um, appreciating, sorry, depreciating is inflation, uh, appreciating is deflation. You don't want that. You want your money to be fairly stable in value all of the time because you want people to build expectations. You want people to know what prices are. And so when a lot of people look at Bitcoin, they say, and, and they hear the stories, are oh, it's money. They think, oh, gee, it's not money. And so they're already suspicious of the idea and they already then get, get told something that they suspect is not true. And so they then react. Unfortunately, many of these people never update their expectations. They simply say, oh, yeah, it's all nonsense. And they throw their hands up in the air. But once we get over that, that's what Satoshi Nakamoto wanted to do. But we know there is the law of unintended consequences. What did Satoshi Nakamoto actually do? Satoshi Nakamoto actually provided us the building blocks for building a new and better economic infrastructure going forward into the world. So it is the, 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 the blockchain technology, which is actually far more valuable than is Bitcoin a money or is Bitcoin not a money. So once we started looking at the, in the innovation hub as to what the technology could do, um, we, we, we became very, very, very optimistic what was going to happen here. Now, the other thing I, I want to explain to a lot of people, um, that they kind of feel that they can't get into blockchain unless they deeply understand the technology. Um, that, is, that is not quite correct. So for example, in the Blockchain Innovation Hub at RMIT, we are social scientists, we are political scientists, we are accountants, um, we've got a few sociologists, all those sorts of people. We don't actually have computer programmers um, because we are not actually investigating the, 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 the technology as technologists. We are investigating the technology as economists, as social scientists, as business academics, those sorts of things, because that's where the future is. And, and I say this to to very many people very often, do you really know how a computer works? Do you know how an airplane flies? Do you know how an internal combustion engine works? And the fact of the matter is we've all got vague ideas as to what happens, but we don't have the detail. And the same with blockchain. You don't need to know the detail of the technology to actually understand the business applications. So what is it that blockchain does that makes it so exciting? And what makes it so exciting pardon me, is something called the electronic markets hypothesis, which was posited in the late 1980s and early 1990s by a guy at MIT called Thomas Malone. And Thomas Malone's argument was that um, because of what he then called the ICT uh, uh, um, uh, um, revolution, was more or less going to change the structure of organizations and institutions in our society. And he said, we more or less have a trade-off between hierarchical institutions and markets. Now, markets work very well in particular situations where we have got high levels of trust. Institutions and, and hierarchies work well in mobilizing trust. What the blockchain does, and this was the article that Nassim actually pointed to at the very beginning that I wrote with Michaela Novak and, and, and Jason Potts, uh, what the blockchain does is it industrializes trust. It actually moves us away from having to handcraft trust. Now, think about the industrial Industrial Revolution. Well, the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago, 250 years ago, however you want to time it, had the effect of replacing human 
and animal power for machine power. What we have done now is we have replaced human trust with industrialized trust. And people say, oh, yeah, you know, so what? What, what does that mean? Well, in, the, in, in, in that paper that we published, I think in the 2018 uh, uh, journal of the, the British Blockchain Association, uh, we calculated using some, uh, some American data, which we then extrapolated into, into the global area, that trust, the cost of trust was basically at least 35% of global GDP which was, um, the number isn't actually in the article, but we, we, we kind of guesstimated that number in the pre-COVID economy was, I think it was about $20 trillion uh, um, of, of, of value. It was just generate. That's how much we were spending every year just to create trust. So trust is astonishingly expensive to create. And we know when something's expensive, you have less of it. And when something is cheap, you get more of it. So what has happened is we have industrialized trust. We have brought to bear a, a, a mechanism which allows us to trust strangers whom we've never met, we've never seen, and we will never meet and we will never see. Now, people say, okay, well, why is that important? Well, why that important is because if you know me, if, if you've heard me speak before or anything, I always harp on local knowledge. All knowledge is local knowledge. And in order to cooperate with others, we need to be able to communicate that local knowledge in a credible manner. And the blockchain is a mechanism of actually communicating, mobilizing local knowledge and information and pushing it over a bigger area, a bigger market. So as the size of the market, so as, as, as yes, the size of the market expands, uh, opportunity expands, the ability to create wealth expands into that market. Now, what are we doing? We are not necessarily here creating a new money. As I've kind of said to you, I, I, I don't believe that blockchain is a good money. But what we are doing is we are building the economic infrastructure for a new global economy. That is, we are building it from the ground up. So in, in that, three things more or less are happening. Um, we are building out markets, which in the last couple of years has become DeFi. So we are building out financial markets. We are building out stable coins, um, which is actually the money on the, uh, um, on, on the blockchain. Uh, we are building out property rights, which translates into NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Now, I could probably talk about non-fungible tokens for a long time, too. A lot of people have the mistaken idea that non-fungible tokens is just art. Non-fungible tokens is not art. Art is a use case of non-fungible tokens. Non-fungible tokens are property rights. I own things. I have things. I can trade these things. And we are building our DAOs, uh, de decentralized autonomous organizations, which is going to be the organizational workhorse of the blockchain going forward. Now, if I think back to 2014, the world that we could imagine in 2014, uh, we were saying, you know, we are going to bank the unbanked, we were going to expand all these sorts of things, and, and critics can and do legitimately point and say, well, that hasn't happened. And one of the reasons why that hasn't happened is because in 2017, uh, 2018, our imaginations had got ahead of ourselves because we didn't then quite have the tools. What we do now have is we've still got the same imagination. We can revolutionize the world. We can bring financial products to people who can't currently get them. We can bring the sharing economy to people who can't quite access it. We can bring the ability to, to mobilize and earn a return of your human capital to people who quite to do that right now because we've built the tools. So we have the tools tools, we have the stable coins, we have the, the, the DeFi markets, we have the NFTs, we have the DAOs, all the tools are now in place. And all that we've got to start doing is fitting those tools together, those bits and pieces together, generating viable business models. And we will find that access to wealth, access to economic opportunity and access to human flourishing will actually go down the kind of lines which we crypto optimists have been promising would happen all along. So, um, you know, that is why I, I kind of think that th this is actually an astonishing opportunity. Um, who are the people going to be left behind? Well, the naysayers, the bitter no coiners, um, the people who have doubts. Now, as, as I said in the very beginning, you know, it's, it's, it's all very well for people to say, look, I don't know what this is. 
But I don't honestly think that anybody can currently say, why are you numpties doing it? Or why are you idiots doing it? Because um, as more and more people get involved, as it becomes more democratized, uh, we will actually see incredible opportunities opening up to anybody who's prepared to take the time and effort to actually make to, 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 to make an investment here, to find out what is going on, to bring their business to market, to, to explore the opportunities that can happen, either as a contributor, as an entrepreneur, or even just as a user. Uh, what will be available to people in future is far greater than anything we've ever seen before. We are at the cusp of another industrial revolution. And this one is not only going to be bigger, it's going to happen a lot faster than the last one did. And Nassim, I see you've come up. So it's time to take some questions or thoughts or comments. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sinclair. That was a fascinating talk. Really very, very informative. Um, we have uh, one question and I would add my little question to this as well. What is, uh, so Ardit Disha asks, what's your prediction on the implementation of uh, crypto technology within five years? And my similar question along the lines is that um, for, um, for hubs, crypto economics hubs, institutions that are looking to do some further research, some of the areas you have mentioned, what are the, some of the key areas where um, further research is required to have a much better under, understanding? Um, so my prediction, um, I always like um, Bill Gates's prediction around these sorts of things where he said, uh, we overestimate what's going to happen in the next two years mm -hmm. and we underestimate what's going to happen in the, in the next 10 years. So five years is between two and 10. Um, so I, I think we're going to have less than we think in two years time. Um, but bearing in mind, I was saying this two years ago, um, before the big DeFi outbreak and before the big NFT outbreak and all this sort of stuff. But I'm incredibly optimistic that in 10 years, this will have mainstreamed. One of the reasons for that, for example, is we saw the state of Wyoming in the United States actually uh, create a, um, a, a, a DAO legal structure. And the Australian Parliament um, here in Australia uh, has, has made a recommendation that a DAO legalized structure happen here. Now, one of the nice advantages of Australia over Wyoming is that um, in Australia, company law is at the national level. So we won't have different levels of government trying to sabotage it. Whereas you might in, in Wyoming, where, where company law is at a state government level, you still have the federal government uh, uh, regulators can still come and can uh, override you. So I, I suspect that once we start having things such as uh, DAOs being, you know, given legal personality and all that sort of stuff. Things will happen very, very quickly in that particular space. Um, what should people be 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 doing here now? <clears throat> As, as I said before, this is a technology that has not emerged out of big business, that has not emerged out of the university sector. So very often we have a lot of people out there who are more or less reinventing the wheel as they go along. So they, they are coming up to, to they, they, they're trying to develop products or ideas and they're solving problems. Many of the problems that they've solved have been solved before, but they're solving them from scratch. Um, so there's a huge education project. Uh, uh, the, 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 that needs to be done. And uh, the, that's where uh, a journal such as the JBBBA does such fantastic work. Um, and then there's also uh, um, very often they, they incorrectly solve the problems. They, they, they run into dead ends or heresies or what have you, and, and they make mistakes, which if people had a, a greater sort of intellectual knowledge, they, they, they wouldn't make. So one of the big things that we do in the hub in our hub at RMITs, we have a massive engagement project uh, where we go out and we actually speak to crypto startups. Now, there's two kinds of crypto startups as well. Very often, there's the crypto startup of technologists who know nothing about business, trying to do a business model. So uh, those people, we actually talk business models to. And then very often, we are now getting more and more existing businesses who want to have a blockchain play. And so we actually talk to them about what can be done in the blockchain space. So there's a combination. You've either got to talk business to technologists or you've got to talk technology to business people. Um, but very definitely, um, even silly things like what makes a successful startup in, in, in the blockchain space um, is, 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 is research that's waiting to be done. Um, how do DAOs work? You know, what is the optimal cap? 
uh, table allocation for DAOs? Um, how can we get more property rights into NFTs? Um, and then just basic education level. So for example, when you are talking NFTs, um, a lot of the artists say, oh no, we've heard all these terrible stories about all the electricity that gets used. Now, Yes, blockchain does burn a lot of electricity, but in actual fact, blockchain burns a lot less electricity than people actually think because the comparisons that get told. So, for example, they will say something like blockchain burns more electricity than Sweden um, or something along those lines. But in actual fact, blockchain burns as much electricity as people leaving their appliances on and plugged, plugged in and switched on. You know, all that kind of wastage around the world, it's about the same as that. So people think that's a trivial amount. So you've got to weigh up. Uh, um, what is known, what is not known, how much disinformation there is out there, how much misinformation is out there. Um, every time somebody like Paul Krugman writes an op-ed about how uh, uh, blockchain is terrible for the world, um, it's, it's, it's terrible because people, he's a very famous, well-regarded economist um, saying things that are like just blatantly not correct or misleading. Um, those tweets that you were responding to a few weeks ago on, on, on Twitter. Um, again, there's also, you know, this, this antagonism towards academics, which you kind of think is if you need help, who can you go and ask? Who's a trusted party you can go and ask? Well, people at your university or a local university will be the kinds of people. But if they have been fed this diet of, you know, all academics hate blockchain, um, they're never going to come and speak to us. Um, you know, so the, 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 there's, the, there's that ironic distrust in a trustless technology uh, that, you know, that, that we need to overcome. But, but certainly there is work to be done on stable coins, on NFTs, on DAOs, on how property rights will emerge in the blockchain space there. Um, if, if you were a young academic now, there's enough to do now that would have a whole career planned out for people. So if, if you're an academic listening to this, I, I would urge you to, 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 to have a look and to see what can be done and, and where it can be done. Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you, Sintra. That was a very detailed explanation. And um, yes, I agree with you. I think I've said this before. This is the best time to do a, a PhD uh, or write a thesis or a dissertation in blockchain or crypto. Um, it's still very new technology. Um, and and, and this, is, this is the best time to get into uh, academia and be a part of the future, shape policies. As Sinclair said, governments and policymakers are looking to, uh, to academics also uh, to help them and guide them uh, in, in making decisions, uh, writing policies um, uh, for, for, for public services, also for governments. So thank you, uh, Sinclair. That was a fascinating uh, talk. Um, we now move on to our Christmas quiz. There is a, um, a surprise prize for all of you who stay till the end and participate in the quiz. We didn't announce it in the beginning. Um, so uh, there are 16 questions and we will share the question with you in the form of a poll. And I want you to um, uh, read the question and uh, answer, the, uh, answer the question. There are multiple choice uh, questions one best answer, and then we will have, um, uh, if required, maybe a slight discussion on, on, on that question. If it's a straightforward question, we'll just move on. So, so let's, uh, let's start. I can see that uh, Mark is here, Professor Mark Pilkington. Mark, if uh, you would like to join the panelist to be kind of a moderator or facilitator, that would be great. If not, that's also okay too. I've just sent you a, a request there. Okay, so let's uh, let's start. Right. So first question on your screen is: All blockchains are distributed ledgers. So on your on your uh, touch screen, please. Uh, there are only two options: yes and no.
Can you see the question on your screen? Can you see the question on your screen? Anybody? Can you see the poll? I've just shared the poll. Can you can you just type your answers? Uh, just hit yes or no. So the first question is easy. Um, yes, that's right. All questions have, have multiple choice. So you can start with the first question. Uh, no, 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 you cannot select more than one when there are uh, two options. You can just, uh, you just have to select one. One answer is right, only one. So the first question is all blockchains are distributed ledgers. Okay, so the answer is yes. Um, all blockchains are distributed ledgers, but not all distributed ledgers are blockchains. So for example, um, Corda and um, IOTA, they are not uh, blockchains, but they are distributed ledgers. So in Corda, for example, there are no blocks, there is no mining, um, but it is a, a form of a distributed ledger. So all blockchains are distributed ledgers, but not all distributed ledgers are blockchains. Next question is, in his Bitcoin paper, how many academic peer reviewed research papers were cited by Satoshi Nakamoto? If you have read the Bitcoin white paper uh, all the way till the end, you will have seen there are a list of references which Satoshi Nakamoto cited in the Bitcoin white paper. How many of those references were academic papers or conference proceedings? None, one, two, three, or five. Okay, so the correct answer is five. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto cited eight references in his Bitcoin white paper in 2008. And if you notice that uh, five of them are academic uh, papers and conference proceedings which makes me think was Satoshi an academic? So the correct answer is five. Next question. In 2014, which university be becomes the first public university in the world to accept Bitcoin in tuition fees? Choices are Cumbria University, UK, Johns Hopkins University, USA, National University of Singapore, University of Queensland, Australia, or University College London, UK. So, um, You may be very, a bit surprised to know that um, Cumbria University in the UK became the first public university in the world to uh, accept Bitcoin tuition fee. Having said that at the same time, um, I believe University of Nicosia was also, um, they also started accepting uh, 
uh, tuition fees payment in Bitcoin uh, round about that time. So if you look at these two articles, this one is from November 2013, and this one is from January 2014. So, um, so I think I believe there these these are the these are the announcements from like within within a two months uh, uh, period. Uh, so because the University of Nicosia is not in the uh, options, uh, we would choose Cumbria. Uh, but it is true that uh, both these universities were the first, uh, one of the first in the world to accept Bitcoin uh, in, in tuition fees. Next question, Ethereum yellow paper was authored by Adam Beck, Gavin Wood, Vitalik Buterin, Andreas Antonopoulos, and Hall Finney. Okay, people are saying Gavin Wood. So Gavin Wood is the correct answer. And you may have seen Ethereum white paper, uh, which is the more commonly read paper. And a white paper is, uh, is, is, was written by Vitalik Buterin, uh, one of the co-founders of Ethereum, uh, in, in forming and launching Ethereum. It was a guidance document, information document, what Ethereum is, uh, what's the purpose uh, and how it will work and all the basic uh, understanding. And a yellow paper is a little bit more technical paper, um, which include the technical specifications of Ethereum virtual machine, the EVM, and, and here it is. And it's not called a yellow paper because it looks slightly yellow. It is a, this is a term we use for, for proper solid hardcore research um, uh, papers. So, so Ethereum yellow paper was written by Gavin Wood, uh, who is uh, from UK, uh, and um, and uh, now he's working in Polkadot and other uh, ventures. Next question: According to evidence-based blockchains hierarchy of evidence, what is considered as the lowest quality of evidence? Opinion. Meta analysis, systematic review, analytical essay, or peer reviewed case study. So the correct answer is uh, is 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 expert opinion, and the um, if you look at this um, this this diagram, this infographic, um, there are two types of information. There is there are two types of evidence. We have filtered evidence, and we have unfiltered evidence. So unfiltered evidence includes opinions, tweets, blogs, and and anything of that sort. And, and these are, these are uh, pieces of information that are not uh, scientifically evaluated. They are not critically analyzed. They are not peer reviewed. And they sit at the, at the lower end of uh, the hierarchy of quality of evidence. And then you have filtered information. So somebody has looked at your, uh, your, your piece of uh, data or your, um, your paper or research or whatever, and has, critically appraised the topic, identified the, the strengths and flaws, and, and now it is, a, um, uh, it, is, it is evaluated, so it is filtered. So systematic reviews and, and meta-analysis are, um, are uh, research, multiple research papers, peer-reviewed case studies that are combined together uh, statistically or otherwise to come to a conclusion about a particular question or a problem. So they sit uh, at the um, at the uh, at the higher end. Next question: Which of these currencies do not offer privacy-preserving techniques? Dash, Zcash, Monero, 
Ethereum or Verge. Okay, so some people have answered Dash, which is an uh, incorrect answer. So the answer is Ethereum. Um, these are some of the pri privacy preserving coins. And what do we mean by that? So it means that um, these are the, the coins that if you transact, uh, it, it is much difficult to, uh, to trace and track and, uh, and transactions uh, can be anonymous. So there are three important pieces of information in a transaction. You have the sender's address, the receiver's address, and the transaction itself. So in case of um, Dash, for example, there, are, there is a private send option. In case of Zcash, there are ZK SNARKs and zero knowledge proofs, et cetera. In case of Monero, you have a stealth addresses. So we don't know which address it has come from, where it's going, uh, and so on. So Ethereum is not a privacy coin per se. Uh, there is a, a, a very interesting article on Decrypt, what are privacy coins? Uh, I've shared it here. Uh, published earlier this year, uh, I would uh, recommend that you, uh, you you read it. So next question, who said, be a free thinker and don't accept everything you hear as truth. Be critical and evaluate what you believe in. Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, Hippocrates. Pythagoras. Okay, some people have said Socrates. Some people have said Aristotle. So critical evaluation, as, as I mentioned before, uh, of information is not something that is new. It's been around for centuries. And it was perhaps uh, one of the most famous philosophers uh, was Aristotle in this regard. Uh, who was a scientist himself. And uh, this was his quote, that we should critically evaluate all pieces of information before we believe in it. So the correct answer is Aristotle. In 2018, next question, world's first center for evidence-based practice on distributed ledger technologies was established in UAE, Estonia, Singapore, UK, Canada. In 2018, world's first center for evidence-based practice on blockchain and distributed ledger technologies was established in which country? So some people said UAE, some said Estonia, some people said UK. So the correct answer is UK. Uh, this was a British Blockchain Association in initiative in 2018. Uh, to, um, uh, to uh, bring some rigor and science to the field of uh, blockchain distributed ledgers and to bridge the blockchain research and practice gap. And uh, we have more than 20 members uh, as of uh, today, uh, including the Open University, which is the largest university in the UK, uh, as well as our MIT University from where Professor Davidson is from and some governments and, and enterprise members, and it is growing very, very fast. We have more than 220 individual members, including researchers, thought leaders, uh, academics, and industry experts. So the correct answer is uh, UK. Next question. Which was the first university library in the world to receive a print copy of the JBBA in July, 2018? July 2018, so this was almost three, four years ago. Um, the reason I included this question is because we have shared this information multiple times on social media, this information. Um, so if you know, you know. Yes, so that's right. Somebody said Cornell. Cornell is the correct answer. So we have um, uh, the JBBA, which is the world's first scientific peer reviewed journal. Uh, on blockchain and crypto assets. And it is, um, it is published online as well as the print copies. So the print copies are sent worldwide to more than 300 libraries uh, around the globe. And we have been doing this for the past four years. And Cornell University was the first university 
to actually wrote to us and acknowledged in writing that we have received your copy, July 2018. Okay, so let's launch the next poll. So six more questions. BBA's Blockchain Associations Forum has how many member countries? So you may have uh, you may have heard of this initiative. Uh, this is a uh, called BAF Blockchain Associations Forum, and um, we have uh, blockchain associations from uh, countries, uh, national associations, uh, uh, non-profit organizations. Um, uh, coming together on one platform. It's called Blockchain Associations Forum. And how many member countries are currently uh, in the forum? 27, 36, 41, 51. So the correct answer is 51. Um, we have 51 member countries uh, who are part of uh, the Blockchain Associations Forum as of today. And this is again growing uh, fast. Next question. How many international scientific conferences have been organized by the BB? One, two, three, or four? How many ISCs, International Scientific Conferences, have been organized by the BBA? So the correct answer is uh, three. And we uh, this was an easy question, actually, because uh, Deborah just mentioned in the, uh, in the beginning that we are hosting fourth uh, International Scientific Conference. So the correct answer is three. This was our first uh, conference. Uh, this is before COVID, in person in London, uh, 2019, March 2019. And um, then we had our second conference, which was in um, Edinburgh in 2020, last year. On your screen, you see uh, Chris Berg, um, one of uh, Sinclair's colleague from Australia presenting his research on blockchain governance. And then we had our third um, conference, which was hosted online uh, because of COVID uh, in um, earlier this year. So we have hosted three conferences. Fourth one is also online and it is on 14th of March. Next question. JBPA follows which blinding technique for external peer review of research papers? Blinding technique, single blind, double blind, triple blind, or there is no blinding in the JBPA. So whilst you are, uh, uh, if you know the answer, great, but if you don't know, if you don't even know what blinding means, so let me explain to you. So when a paper is submitted to a journal for peer review, uh, the, the journal has uh, uh, four options. One option is to, um, uh, is to um, uh, keep it single blind. So single blind means that the, uh, the researchers don't know who has reviewed uh, their paper. The double blind option is when both the author and the reviewers don't know each other's identity. A triple blind is when uh, neither the editor nor the author or uh, and the reviewers know um, each other's um, identity. Uh, and the other option is then there is no blinding. So everybody knows everybody's identity. So the correct answer is uh, double blind. So we have a double blind peer review policy at the JBBA. So each article is assessed purely on the basis of its merit. Uh, reviewers don't know who the author is and the authors don't know who the reviewers are. Now, sometimes it is not always possible because, because it's a, is a, is a uh, relatively small and narrow uh, field. 
And if you know that somebody is doing pioneering work in some area, you can sometimes guess, but this is the best we could do. Um, and it, it is quite helpful in, in, uh, uh, in making sure that the papers are assessed on the basis of uh, the content and, and, its, and its merit, not from which institution you have come from or the prestige, prestigiousness of the university or the, or the previous track record of the author. So you may have published 100 papers, but if your next paper is, is not uh, up to the scratch, then it will get rejected. Um, so it's not on the basis of your reputation or the previous work, it's just purely on the basis of what the, uh, the, the paper in front of uh, the reviewers is. And uh, to tell you something very interesting, we, we have rejected uh, papers from our own professors of our editorial board. And it happened only because the, the other reviewers and editors from the board uh, did not know. They had no idea who, who wrote the paper. And uh, so the paper was rejected on the basis of uh, uh, the paper itself. And so, so, the, so we follow double blind policy, uh, both the reviewers and the uh, authors don't know each other's identity. Next, how many Bitcoins are created per day? 400, 900, 1500, or 2000? Now, you could guess this question, or if you have, uh, if you have the logic behind it, uh, I would be very happy to, uh, from the attendees, to take someone on the panel. Anybody wants to explain how they have reached their answer? So who said 900? Can you type in the chat? So Erdita said 900. Erdita, are you happy to, to join me and explain how you have reached this? Erdita Komaraku? Okay, so let me explain how, how we, uh, why 900, 900 is the correct answer. It's okay, don't worry. So Bitcoins are created on the basis of uh, a block. Each, when each block is created, miners, people who are uh, including all the transactions in each block, they get rewarded for their effort. And this reward is in the form of Bitcoins. And uh, approximately every 10 minutes, uh, a block is uh, created. And the block reward when the Bitcoin was launched was uh, 50 Bitcoins per block. And it is it gets halved every uh, four years. So it was uh, 50 Bitcoins in, uh, in 2008. Then in 2012, it reduced to 25. Then in 2016, it reduced to 12.5. Uh, and then in 2020, it is now down to 6.25 Bitcoins per block. So you can do the maths, 6.25 every 10 minutes, uh, multiply by that by uh, six. So you get the number of Bitcoins produced per hour. And then you times that by uh, 24 and it comes to 900. Yeah, so somebody said, yeah, that's right in the chat. Which of these has not been a JBBA cover page theme? Not been a JBBA cover page theme. So you have seen our JBBA, the print editions. We have a cover page and we have published uh, eight uh, issues in the last four years. Every five to six months, we publish the journal. And there is a, there is a theme uh, each time. Each issue has a theme. So on the cover page, which of these has not been featured? Evidence-based blockchain, algorithmic governance, institutional crypto economics, enterprise blockchain, national blockchain roadmaps, or consensus protocols. not been on the cover page. 
So a few people said algorithmic governance. Um, are you sure about that? Uh, okay. Any other guesses? So um, algorithmic governance has been featured actually on the cover page uh, in May 2020 issue uh, was on algorithmic governance. Evidence-based blockchain has been featured, enterprise. So the one, so Ahmed is right. Uh, consensus protocols has not been featured on the, on the JBBA cover so far. Consensus protocols is the correct answer. It has not been featured. Quantum blockchains, national roadmaps, enterprise blockchain, uh, they, they, they have all been featured on the cover. And the last question. UK's national blockchain roadmap, which you may have read, it's published earlier this year, makes a recommendation to establish some subspecialty groups. How many subspecialty groups were recommended in the roadmap? Six, eight, 10, or 12? Okay, votes coming in. Majority says 10 subspecialty groups. Two people said eight. Okay. So the correct answer is eight. So we propose eight subspecialty groups uh, in the UK's National Blockchain Roadmap, which was published in July. And uh, these are citizens and public services, crypto assets, policy and regulation, research and education, social good and life sciences, governance, allied disciplines, such as IoT, AI, quantum computing, etc. Uh, emerging tech, Sinclair mentioned DAOs, NFTs, DeFi's, Lightning Network and others, and enterprise and startups. Uh, so there are eight subspecialty groups for mentioned uh, and proposed in, uh, in, the, in the National Blockchain Roadmap recommendations. On the right side of your screen, you see a, the crypto asset subspecialty group, uh, which um, uh, the recommendations are that it should be a multidisciplinary subspecialty group. Um, and uh, and this, and for this paper is in the um, uh, on the BBA websites in the public domain. You can read more about that. So that comes to the end of our poll uh, and quiz. Thank you very much for participating. Now, what we do is um, now first of all, any questions? Any questions about the quiz itself? No questions. I hope you found it useful. So, um, so what we uh, what we do uh, every month is that we randomly uh, pick a winner uh, who uh, is who gets a, a complimentary uh, ticket to the ISC twenty twenty two. What we did this time is something slightly different. Is we decided to give uh, uh, something to everybody. So the, um, all those who have participated, not, not just those who, who have registered, all those who have participated, so people who are here, and, and we know this, we have got this data from Zoom, um, you are entitled to a, a massively discounted ticket um, for ISC 2022. If you go to the BBA website, and click on ISC 2022 portal. It will take you to the to the conference page, and you will get a seventy percent discount on the ticket. So the ticket is only thirty pounds or so. And uh, please note that this is only for the next forty eight hours, and the tick and the ticket sale will end after that. So you have to book in the next forty eight hours if you want to uh, get your um, 
uh, ticket, the discounted ticket. And this is the lowest price ticket that we have for the ISC. It is not going to come back again. Um, and the, the tickets are, uh, sales are now live. So all the delegates who have attended today, you are the first ones to know um, about the conference registrations. And uh, we want to thank you for this. Uh, and we decided to give all of you uh, a discount on the, on the ticket. So go to the BBA website, ISC 2022 conference portal. It will take you to the conference page and you can get your ticket there. But please note that Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon, uh, this ticket is going to disappear from the portal. So um, if, you, if you are interested, if you're planning to attend, uh, please do so now. Okay, um, any more questions? I think if we have no further questions, um, I would like to thank all the, um, uh, all the attendees, um, the panelist, Professor Davidson, um, for a fascinating talk. And we will see you hopefully uh, next year uh, in January. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Or, uh, or follow the BBA um, LinkedIn or, and Twitter pages. So thank you very much and um, have a very, very nice uh, Christmas and, and a happy new year. And uh, we'll, we'll see you in, in next year. Uh, by the way, recording of this should be available very soon on our YouTube channel. So if you have um, missed the talk and you want to see uh, again, uh, please visit our YouTube channel. Uh, for the recording of this session. Thank you very much and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.